afternoon, everybody. Good morning to our friends on the West Coast. I am Todd Obert, President and CEO of Productive Corporation. Uh, joined alongside me here is Chuck Carroll, Associate Pre-Sales Manager from Kaspersky Lab. And today we are going to talk about making virtual security more effective. If uh, you have seen KSV in the past, well, welcome, and uh, you're going to see it uh, once again. If you are not taking advantage of uh, virtual security, either agentless or light agent, um, you should really be thinking about it. Uh, virtual security is a big, big area as there's been a ton of virtualization and environments out there and something really to consider for efficiency's sake. Today, um, we're going to go through it. We're going to do it in 30 minutes or less. Uh, first thing up, though, we are going to meet productive in one minute. We will contrast traditional versus agentless security, show you a little bit about light agent security, and then get into looking at uh, KSV in Security Center, going over some reports and policy options, all the great stuff that Chuck is planning to show you today. But for now, let's buckle up and meet Productive. Who is Productive Corporation? Well, I'm very glad you asked. Productive Corporation provides security solutions for mid-size companies. We have expertise to help you with technical and licensing questions so you don't have to navigate the world all on your own. We also implement, test, and optimize the products that we sell. In addition to that, we do network health reviews, Active Directory security, uh, vulnerability assessments, uh, penetration tests. We also do configuration assistance and UTM services for the products that we sell. In addition to that, we create a lot of our own content. You can find this at ProductiveCorp.com backslash content, as well as on our YouTube channel. Bottom line is, we have the resources to help you. Whether it's implementation, assessment, licensing, or optimization, we are here to help. Help at ProductiveCorp.com. And one of the ways that we help is by uh, talking about relevant technology for the mid-market. Um, as I mentioned at the top of it, I mean, virtualization is uh, a big, big area in, uh, in the environment. And I would say um, almost 90 plus percent of the environments we speak with today are somewhat virtualized. And uh, I think that number is going to grow to 100% uh, very soon. They, uh, it's, it's the way that people want to build their server rooms. It is less space. It's more efficient with resources and with the rise of Hyper-V, I think uh, has made it much more affordable for the mid-market. So today, we're going to have Chuck Carroll from Kaspersky Lab, who is the uh, Associate uh, Pre-Sales Manager. Did I get that right, Chuck? Uh, yep, that's, that's yep. what they're calling now. <laughs> that's what they're calling. Uh, Chuck's been with Kaspersky Lab for the past six years has spent a lot of time in technical support, so knows kind of uh, what you guys go through on a daily basis and really has helped uh, you guys in your time of need. And I think today is going to talk about some stuff and uh, hopefully will deliver a very interesting uh, perspective on what we should be thinking about in terms of traditional versus agentless security. So let's give a warm virtual round of applause for Mr. Chuck Carroll. Chuck? Hi, thank you. I can hear all that applause. It's, it's <laughs> off the hook. I've had to mute it to, uh, so I can just hear. It's mayhem, bedlam here. OK. Well, so what we have here is uh, a couple of slides here to show you uh, how our uh, virtual uh, protection software works and some of the issues that uh, you would run into uh, this first slide is really just showing what happens if you don't use uh, a software that's uh, specifically designed for virtual environment where you know there's really only one computer here the hypervisor and we're dividing up all of those resources amongst multiple guest machines and uh, traditionally you'd have to install a full antivirus client on each of these and they are going to consume a lot of resources to do that um, even though all of these machines are really on the same single computer and they're ask, usually typically accessing the same data store, uh, each one is, is uh, kind of doing a redundant uh, function here. 
And this can work okay in, in uh, some of our environments, provided there's enough resources available. But what we would typically uh, run into with antivirus software that's typically managed uh, by groups of computers where all of the computers are going to want to be updating simultaneously or scanning simultaneously with the scan tasks and such, that those resources are going to get consumed very quickly. Uh, and uh, while if it's just a, if the computers aren't very busy, everything might come along okay, but as soon as an update has to happen, um, all of a sudden all those resources that are shared are have uh, disappeared in a hurry. Uh, if we could, uh, we could probably go to the next, uh, the next slide there. And so, with the uh, agentless software that we have, this is a Kaspersky Security for Virtualization agentless. This is uh, this works on VMware environments only, and it leverages the VMware's vShield technology, uh, or uh, NSX is the newest version of that uh, type of technology. But this is an architecture that uh, VMware provides us that gives us insight into what the guest machines are accessing in terms of what files they're, they're creating or reading from, from storage. And we can tunnel that information into a single appliance. Uh, we call it your security virtual machine or an SVM or SVA. It's, it's an appliance. It's a, a virtual appliance that's uh, installed as another VM on each hypervisor. And through that vShield infrastructure, uh, we can see what the guests are actually doing. And the only machine that has an antivirus program on it is that appliance itself. So uh, through the VMware tools driver that gets installed typically on each uh, guest, uh, that can tell uh, the appliance what the clients are actually accessing, and then the appliance can do all of the work. So this becomes the only computer there that's running any antivirus. Uh, this allows the hypervisor to uh, control and to share the resources more efficiently so that one appliance can't take over, can't take down the entire uh, host uh, if it's busy doing something. Uh, and um, But we can still do the basic file antivirus uh, type of protection where we can, we can scan files that are being accessed by the clients for malware and viruses. Uh, so this, you know, no more um, uh, scan storms or instant on gaps as soon as a guest machine uh, boots, it's being protected by a computer that has up-to-date antivirus immediately as soon as it connects to the network. Um, so we can, you know, we have higher VM densities here and less, this, this product will have the very least impact on the performance of the guest machines or the hypervisor as a whole. Uh, so this, this next slide here just shows a, a diagram uh, of the vCenter uh, setup where each VM has basically nothing installed on it. We just put our appliance that says KSV there in the middle, and that's the computer that talks to our security center server and sends the information back to that server about what's happening uh, in the VM environment in terms of uh, updates. It receives its updates from the central server and, and uh, all of its instructions, its configuration, its scan tasks, and the virus definitions are just delivered to that SVM. And then through the vShield manager uh, and the vShield infrastructure, we access the files. So the other option we have is our light agent uh, software, this Kaspersky Security for Virtualization light agent. This is sort of a hybrid of the two concepts. It's, uh, we, we will install our software on each guest, and we'll still use an appliance that's doing all of the scanning. But the software that we install on each guest has all of the uh, the heavy lifting, I like to say, has been removed from the individual antivirus programs that go on to the guests. And that job has been passed off to the SVM. So we can still have, we have more, this gives us more insight into what's actually happening on each guest uh, than, uh, than with the agent list. The agent list will only tell us what files are being accessed. So we can look at the files and we can scan them from malware, but we can't do any uh, uh, process monitoring or advanced heuristics. We can't uh, you know, use our web control or device control to control what users are allowed to, to attach to their systems. Uh, and we can't look at the, the, uh, the activity of individual processes that might be malicious, but may not be recognized by a traditional virus signature. 
So this is sort of, this kind of is the best of both worlds. It will have a little bit more resource consumption on each guest, but uh, the components that do install on the guests are not the ones that really consume CPU or, or RAM. Uh, I mean, it's not, is it significant resource, Chuck? It's not significant, is it? Um, usually, usually not, but you know, the, uh, there's, it's, it's the scanning and the updating. Uh, that, that are usually consume the most resources, and those things have been handed off to the appliance. So gotcha. we still have that doing all of the all of the hardware. You know, for example, there's a, still a firewall component that we'll install in Light Agent. Well, firewall is just kind of a switch, like it's on or it's off. It doesn't have to mm -hmm. do thinking or calculating uh, to for that to run. So the firewall really consumes almost nothing. Uh, the systems manager has to do a little bit of thinking, but it's really not that much. It's really the mm -hmm. scanning scanning the files for viruses and again like I said the the updates um, so again only one computer is doing that so whenever each VM turns on it's it, it's all of the scanning so therefore all of the updates only have to be uh, delivered to the appliance so that's always on it's always going to be up to date so when a new guest boots up like you know in a say a VDI environment it's going to mm -hmm. be immediately detected uh, so, and here you can see in this diagram, it shows each VM and we, we will install our network agent, which is a very thin application that runs locally and plugs into the installed antivirus client and talks directly to our security center. So we're going to get more detailed events and reporting from each guest machine directly to our security center that's stored in our database and we can do searches and queries and reports about information on each guest there. Uh, as well as uh, the the appliance as well will also talk to the security center and get its updates and uh, its policies and tasks all centrally managed through the security center interface. Well, that seems like a good segue, Chuck. Let's have you uh, take a look at this. And uh, as we're, uh, you know, handing control over to you, can you tell me a little bit of uh, benefits of, uh, you know, why would you go light agent versus agentless? Um, well, mainly it's one other big thing I didn't mention is the light agent can work on multiple different uh, hypervisors. It's not restricted to just VMware, so that it can run a Hyper-V environment or mm -hmm. Linux as well, and some Linux uh, uh, virtualization platforms. So that by itself is, you know, perfectly good reason right there. But also we're going to get a higher level of protection because we can do the process monitoring and, and those deep heuristics. Uh, that are going to be done on each each computer. We're going to scan the web traffic uh, with the web antivirus, the mail antivirus, all the same kind of uh, protection that you get, the same level of protection that you would get on the endpoint security for Windows or any any other uh, you know uh, tech uh, you know uh, antivirus program, advanced antivirus antivirus program that's installed on a physical computer. Uh, so higher level of protection mainly. Uh, and gotcha. for flexibility with different uh, different VM uh, architectures. So different yep. um, So hey, um, I've sent you control. You need to show us your screen so we can see you. Um, and there we go. I see it, and I see uh, Kaspersky Security Center 10 looking great. Okay. I wasn't sure which screen it was going to. Oh, I can see it gives me. I see the control now. Yeah, I'm not used to looking at it on this end because I'm usually having the control of the of the mm -hmm. webinar or the go to meeting link. So, uh, but this will work. So you know, normally, oops, look at that. Let's see if I can unlock that for us. While I'm talking, my screensaver kicked up. So if we, this is our security center server. This is our uh, central management server that we use to uh, to manage all of our security products. Uh, for anyone, I'm assuming that some of the attendees are going to be already familiar with this. Uh, mm -hmm. But this is, um, uh, if anybody isn't, this is the, the tool that, that we use to manage both the physical and the virtual environments here. Uh, it's a centralized management server and stores all of its data into uh, a SQL database. And basically, we create a hierarchical structure here that we use to, uh, to control and manage and distribute our software. And Right now, I've just got a few little test groups here. I've got a virtual group to show um, uh, just some of the, the, the settings that are available. Since this, this particular uh, test uh, system is not connected to a, a, a virtual environment that I can manage, 
I can't show those things, but there's not very much to see there. Mainly what we want to look at is the capabilities and the settings of the uh, applications. And those are controlled by these policies here. Uh, when we have our virtual appliances deployed, they'll be listed here. I, I'll show you one of my physical ones if, if for anybody that hasn't seen uh, this before, but we'll see the security virtual machines in here, and it'll tell us that the software is running, what software is installed, all of the events that are registered by that computer are going to be sent here, and we can review them here by looking at the details of the, uh, of the system if we need to see any more information like that. So the policies are where the settings for the program here are controlled. If I go back into the virtual group here, uh, just take a quick look at our agent list. Uh, this, since this just does our basic file antivirus and it can do also a network attack blocker uh, settings as well, uh, there's not as much to see here, but we can uh, specify uh, the events, how long they're going to be stored and saved. We can also on here configure the systems to send an email, uh, this, or the security center will send an email uh, to the administrator in case certain events are registered. If you wanted to be notified of that, we could do that here. Uh, but this is where we can control those things. The main settings of the antivirus are done through this root protection profile. This is going to be basically the settings that are applied to all of the guest VMs by default that, that are being managed by this policy. Uh, and our uh, recommended security level is a default setting. Uh, we can look in there and just see you know, the types of files that we're going to be looking at for the real-time protection, uh, what things to detect, uh, basically everything, and what to do in case something uh, is detected the automatic choices there, but typically we're going to disinfect and delete uh, the, the file if the disinfection isn't possible. Uh, we can set here whether or not to scan network drives, and we can create exclusions from the scan. Uh, by default, Microsoft has uh, kindly given us a nice long list of things here that they think we should not scan, and so those are included by default into the policy, uh, but you can, of course, create additional exclusions uh, for individual files or folders, and uh, we can also just scan uh, based on uh, extension as well, or exclude based on extension. Uh, it, that's basically it. All of those settings are going to be applied to every protected guest as soon as it connects. Uh, we can also create separate profiles, uh, protection profiles here, if we wanted to have different settings for individual or groups of, uh, of virtual machines. Uh, uh, these a profile, we, we just have to give it a name, and uh, we basically have the same the same options here that you see in the root protection profile. This just allows you to make one that's slightly different. You can change the settings here. Uh, once those any profiles are created here, we can assign those to the infrastructure. In this section here, we need to be able to connect to the vCenter server and get the information from that vCenter server about what guests are out there because we don't have any of our software installed on the agentless machines. We have to get this information indirectly through the VMware environment. So once connected, we'll see the infrastructure would show up here. Each uh, guest that's connected to each ESXi host would show up here, and it will show us which profile. It'd be root by default, uh, but we could assign a specific profile if we had multiple profiles, and we can also select a guest machine and temporarily disable protection. Uh, if you need to do that for some kind of troubleshooting or some other uh, reason, uh, we can turn it off individually on an individual guest through here. Uh, otherwise, these are just your basic core uh, behavior settings here about uh, monitoring, uh, backup files. Anything detected is going to be moved to backup so that we can restore it in case it was detected inadvertently or something that we didn't want to delete got deleted. Uh, we enable the integration with our Kaspersky security network, which is our, our cloud infrastructure uh, that um, uh, will send updated information uh, more quickly to each uh, each antivirus program that's that's running. Uh, in between, and that this will get you know quicker updates, uh, uh, reputation service on individual files, and it can be delivered more quickly than the standard uh, antivirus. Uh, definition update process, which that process of, of creating virus definitions, publishing them to the internet servers, uh, 
downloading them to your environment and, and then distributing them to your systems. That takes much more time. Through the Kaspersky Security Network, we can get more updated information on individual files uh, much more quickly. Uh, but this is how we have to enable that here. Um, if we're going to use the network attack blocker component, this is an additional appliance that would need to be deployed uh, to uh, in the environment that can monitor the network traffic. But this is uh, basically turn it on and turn it off. As those are our options, and it's going to detect uh, you know things like denial of service attacks, uh, brute force attacks, uh, in, in penetration testers might be detected. Anything that's doing a port scanning operation, the network attack blocker component would detect and actually block the. That's, that's uh, attacking. And in case you needed to make an exclusion, we can do that there. Uh, and then the, uh, the web address scan here, this is basically going to uh, scan URLs uh, and just check against a blacklist of known malicious sites. It can't scan the data directly here <coughs> through the web connection, but we, we can block access to certain websites that have been that have been previously blacklisted. So, so you do have some options with agent lists. It's just not yep. the kind of flexibility of the light agent, or you can't, you know, manage across different hypervisors. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But for you know, for uh, you know, core servers, things, application servers, things like that that aren't don't have users touching them directly, this this may be uh, a good solution. Uh, to conserve resources of machines that are otherwise hardened down in a, in a protected environment. Uh, mm -hmm. Anything with a user on it, I would be much more comfortable seeing the light agent on there because we have that web and mail protection and those are the main entry points for, for malware. So uh, if we, we can look at that um, setup here as well, uh, let me uh, close out of this policy and we can see that I've got a couple of different policies. We also have, uh, you know, protection for uh, for Linux machines now with the latest latest version. But we've got a couple of different policies here. Uh, one actually controls the settings of the appliance. There's not much to see here uh, with the appliance. Just uh, some event notifications settings that you can have. Uh, basically, configuring an active policy and turning it on. That's about all there is to set here. Uh, for this only affects the appliance itself. Uh, for the light agent application for Windows, this is going to be managed just like our physical clients, and it has all of the same features, uh, with the exception of the uh, encryption components. So, if you're familiar with endpoint security for Windows, this will look very familiar. Uh, the only thing missing here is an encryption section. Uh, but so here we have similar, very similar um, options here at the top, where we just define the uh, the name of the policy and whether it's the active policy or an out-of-office policy. These only exist really because they exist in the physical world. They don't really have an application in the, in the uh, virtual world here. But we can configure the events that each client uh, will register uh, and whether or not to store them, how long to store them, and no notification settings uh, for uh, malicious object detected, we might want to send an email to the administrator. We could do that. We see a little envelope icon there just as an example. Uh, but here we also have our endpoint control components. They're the same components that are installed in our physical machines uh, with endpoint security for Windows. Uh, we have the application startup control where we can actually police what users are allowed to run. Uh, if you had um, an application on the network that you found out about that you don't want users to run, you can make a rule here that will prevent uh, individual users from being able to run that. Uh, we can, uh, I have uh, one category here created here, but I could create uh, a rule for that. I could select individual Active Directory users if I don't want this to apply to the entire uh, infrastructure. Uh, and uh, and then we can uh, we can give those uh, give those users uh, we can uh, you know, choose whether or not to uh, to block or allow based on uh, based on that category of applications. Um, the uh, by default, these allow all rules are going to be in place, uh, but um, but we can we can uh, we can change change that and just uh, just have this run in, a, in effect to allow only certain applications uh, to run. Uh, the application privilege control is a little different than this. This is going to create uh, or control what 
applications that are allowed to run, what they can access on the operating system uh, and, and what they can do. Uh, so each application that's launched on here is going to be categorized based on these settings here. Uh, it's going to get, it's going to examine information in the executable file itself, like looking for a digital signature. Uh, and also it's going to check against the RKSN database again about whether or not what the reputation of this executable is and it can check against the MD5 hashes and things like that. So it's a very small amount of information that gets sent. But based on that information, it's going to uh, put the executable into a group. And those groups have certain permissions from the trusted group, of course, isn't restricted at all. But as we go down these different rules, the applications become more and more restricted in what they what they're actually able to do. Like, you know, low restricted. They can do most things, but they they uh, you know can't uh, access system modules, uh, and that's about all. They are allowed to talk on the network. This uh, component also it does tie into our firewall. Uh, the combination of these application rules and our firewall will uh, specify whether or not a, a program can send network traffic. As we get more restricted, we can see more stuff gets blocked. What what the uh, files can access in the in the registry, uh, you know, stopping other threads, uh, interacting with drivers, and so forth. Uh, and these in the high restricted group, they can't. They're not going to be allowed to talk on the network. And as you get into untrusted, they pretty much can't do anything. I'm not even sure what kind of program would function with all these restrictions. Maybe a screensaver that just shows you a few pictures or something. But so the the purpose for this though is to prevent unrecognized programs from having too much access to anything on the system. To, it will prevent it from being able to cause much harm if we don't know what it is. We may on a zero day type of threat, brand new uh, piece of malware. We don't have a signature for it. We don't recognize it. It may, you know, the the creators of these things are very clever in in trying to hide themselves from antivirus programs. So using this kind of technology, you can say, sure, we may not see that that's a virus, but or malware, but we don't know what it is, so we're not going to let it do very much. Uh, and this will actually, you know, prevent malware from being able to execute. Uh, and even without us recognizing it as such, and it can prevent uh, something, say, like a ransomware outbreak from being able to spread. Uh, and, and Chuck, this has been part of uh, uh, the Kaspersky product for quite some time. Yes, long time, since Endpoint Security was released, uh, you know, like four or five years ago. So Yeah. And so these are sort of, some would call these like next-gen type functions. The other one, that's doing that kind of thing is the system watcher component, uh, but uh, but yeah, they, they, these these have been around for some time, and they'll work on the you know on the uh, on the virtual software the same way as they work in the physical environment. Uh, so with the device control, uh, we can control uh, just what it says. These these different types of peripheral devices, we can control access to those from users. Uh, most typically, uh, you might want to prevent users from being able to uh, connect uh, thumb drives, for example. So we can go into the details there. We can, with the different devices, you have different options because they do different things. But, you know, most typically uh, you would, you know, prevent people from being able to to, uh, to access them at all. But we can also specify that, well, you can read only, but you can't write to them or you can't access either. Uh, so Chuck, we're getting uh, close to the end of our time. Is there any, you know, one last thing or anything, final thoughts you want to leave before I take back control? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I don't have to go into too much detail here, uh, but with all of these, uh, all of these different things, if they're, it's, it's basically going to be, you know, just like, uh, just like the physical client, uh, we're protecting the mail, uh, we're actually scanning the web traffic as it's coming in before it gets written to disk, so any, any malicious files will be blocked. They won't even be able to be written to disk uh, with these, uh, these network-based technologies here. Uh, and our, our firewall would also replace uh, the Windows firewall in this, in this sense. The system watcher is another one, another important component here I wanted to mention here. Uh, because this is using, this is looking at the actual behavior of particular threads, not even just the reputation, but also what it's actually doing. And it can determine if some behavior that a process is running is malicious. And if it does detect that, that something is malicious, it can 
stop the process, quarantine it, and actually roll back any changes that the process made. You know, it's actually keeping a cache locally of all of the changes that any particular process have made on the system. So this is your key uh, component for protecting against ransomware. Usually when this is enabled, we're pretty well covered. Uh, but, uh, and this, this is the kind of uh, functionality that isn't available in the agentless product. So that's another key reason to be using uh, the light agent whenever you can on virtual workstations anyway. So the other settings here are just some more performance tweaks, uh, how we're going to actually find our uh, virtual appliances and so forth. Uh, there's a couple of options there. And um, you know other things like what we're going to allow the user to see in the program interface and such. Uh, but mainly, that's those are the key features uh, that differentiate this from the uh, agentless and from the physical software for uh, for physical environments altogether. All control. Awesome. So. Um, well, fantastic. Um, that is uh, great stuff, Chuck. Uh, really appreciate it. A um, lot of stuff here. I mean, if you're interested in um, taking a look uh, at KSV for your environment, we would be happy to do a custom demo and talk more specifically about your environment and any types of things that might be nuances. Uh, you know, very de deployable across all sorts of environments, but sometimes it's good to talk about what you have going specifically. But for now, uh, we're wrapping up. Uh, this web event, I really appreciate you taking 30 minutes to uh, spend that part of your day with us. I know you have a lot of things going on, so the fact that you chose to come here is very much appreciated. Chuck, fantastic presentation. Uh, our account execs will be reaching out, and if you need anything in the meantime, let us know. I'm Todd Obert from Productive, along with Chuck Carroll from Kaspersky, wishing you a fantastic balance of your day and week, and hopefully we'll talk soon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.